Hello, I'm Claudia De Brito, editor of Hotelier. Today I have with me Amir Gobarg, who is Vice President of Innovation Hotels. Thank you very much for joining us. A delightful pleasure, Claudia, and, and thanks for hosting me today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so we're here to talk about the new normal in hospitality, the, the new way that we're going to do business in our industry going forward. Yeah, I mean, it's been, uh, to, say, to say the least, it's been a very interesting time for us in the industry um, and obviously us as a company. Um, you know, obviously this was, I think, in, in many sense, hit everyone by, by storm and the travel trade and the industry was, was obviously one of the heaviest the hit. Um, from this current impact. But I think it's an interesting one because, you know, um, I always say, as, 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 as a basic outline, I always say crisis creates creativity. And I think that's one of the things that has really come, come out of this, this current COVID crisis. And I think we've really, you know, gone back to the drawing board in many aspects and started reviewing, you know, what are the basics, you know, going back down at the end, you know, the, the Maslow pyramid, looking at what are the basics of what a consumer or a guest is looking at. Uh, be it the health and safety aspect, being the assurance of a brand and what the offerings are from a consumer perspective. And I think there are a lot of these areas that we need to review back all the way from, from the drawing board of, of how we do and how we perform hospitality. Go back down to the core of hospitality, um, which we see as sort of the six-step guest cycle, which is a six-step experience from a pre-stay to a post-departure experience. Um, and we launch what we call a dedicated guest guardian. Um, so with the guest guardian, I would say under regular circumstances, the six-step guest cycle is all about maximizing touch points and really elevating touch point experiences. Now it's gone the opposite, reverse model, is looking at all those touch points and how do we minimize the touch points while maximizing experiences. So I think it's really reverse engineering the basics of luxury hospitality and looking at how we can really um, assure our guests of the safety post-COVID. So with the dedicated guest guardian, we obviously work closely with our partners, Equilab and Johnson Diversity, who, who uh, have supported us throughout the years across our hotels. Um, and really gone down and looked at some of the products we use, how the sanitation measures are in place. And I think one of the things that really was assuring to me um, as a hotelier, and as well, I think is assuring to the consumer and our, and our team members has been a lot of the measures are already in place and I think a lot of the products we have been using pre-COVID um, from the EPA approved disinfectants to electrostatic spray technology which is now a new addition to it but a lot of these products were already in place um, and if you go and read through all of the products that we have been using they all cover all of the 99.9% .9 of the germs and bacteria, including all the strains of COVID. So these are actually things that we did have in place and in the kitchens with the elevated HACCP and FSMS measures. And obviously some of the local authorities here have a lot of elevated premium measures in place prior to COVID. So I think the difference now to where we were before was sort of magnifying a lot of that and sort of in ensuring the consumer that we actually did have a lot of it in place, but now it's more visibly in place. You know, a, a, a good example of that, and I think this is an interesting one. You walk into a hotel lobby and, and you see, you know, you, you see everything is spick and span and clean, but you never actually realize that there is um, a, a series of what we call public area attendants that are there the full day cleaning and measuring and wiping down. And this is a basic standard of hospitality. We do that across our resorts. The difference now is the guests would walk in and they would want to see that person. Whilst previously, traditionally, we call it the fly on the wall. You wouldn't see them, but you only see the end result. Now you want to see the process as well. And I think that's what kind of has magnified. And I think we've been a little bit more I think a little bit more vocal and a little bit more visible in the approach to make sure that all of these processes are clearly outlined for the guests to assure them that whilst we did have a lot in place, now it's more of elevating that approach moving forward. And I think another area um, which has, I think, really worked to our strength is on, and I think this is more of a post-COVID initiative, but is on the wellness side of the business. You know, Anantara has been synonymous with spa and wellness historically. So we've always been known for running signature spas within our resorts. I think the more the more the emphasis of COVID is coming now, the more the discussions are going around the immune system, health and wealth, well-being, you know, and building your own personal uh, personal immunity to overcome any future, you know, pandemics or any issues that would arise. And I think 
this has really given us an opportunity to elevate a lot of the offerings and hopefully when we do come back into to business and trade again you will see a lot more wellness and holistic offerings together with the journeys and experiences that we already have in the resort. So I think that's another elevated opportunity and initiative that we're actively working on as well. Um, and that sort of is, is predominantly Anantara, which is the luxury sector. And the Avani brand, we're launching what's called the Avani Shield, um, which will be hopefully launched in, in, a, in a week or so from now. And that's going to cover a very similar measure, but more in line with, with the Avani's uh, trendy lifestyle model. But again, an assurance for our, for our guests and team members that obviously we're going to be looking at every single touch point and maximize that as well. So yeah, a lot of measures. I think, again, creativity has been the name of the game and looking at how we, we maximize all the efforts. So it's been, it's been exciting. While it's been disruptive, it's also been exciting from a creative perspective. Well, that's a great way of looking at it. And uh, I, absolutely, mm. through through challenges come come opportunities, and, and, and come the the opportunity to be creative, to exercise creativity. Um, what have been some of your biggest challenges during this time? I mean, it's you know, it's an interesting one when it comes to the challenges because I I would sort of break it up into milestones, you know, and we've sort of gone through this wave of milestones over the last quarter, and I think what what we've been blessed as a company, I think, is you know, we whilst we are quite large, we're not that large, so we've had a very close tight knit communication channel from Asia all the way through to to, to Europe. And very early on in, 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 in Jan, we had got the signs already. So the signs were there. We knew that in China, our operations are, are, are being disrupted in our food and beverage and hotels. So we created very early on a group and, and drizzled down from the chairman all the way down to the properties. So we sort of tried to mitigate as much as possible well in advance and alert our owners and our property teams of things that may arrive. However, again, you know, However well you plan, you never really expect to what extent it will come. And I think one of the greatest challenges really um, has been you know, how do you maximize um, the cash flow and liquidity on a property level when you're in a region dealing with numerous owners. You know, we're managers in this region, we're not owners of most of the assets that we manage. And I think it's really looking at how do you maximize retention, that's been our first priority. We want to retain your team members, we want to retain the the MIP, we call it, the minor intellectual property, which is again driven around the team members and the resorts and hotels we run. And at the same time, safeguard the owner's well being, safeguard the cash flow that is obviously been flooding out over this period. And so we went through the initial phase of shock where the cancellation and all the all the impact came with starting from Chinese New Year, really started building up. And from there on, it's just been an ongoing curve. Um, Refocusing every day and realizing that the next day you wake up, the whole thing has changed and you have to throw it down the bin. Um, through then the second phase, which was realizing there is actually no demand and let's just go into hibernation mode of number of our hotels. And that was a tough decision to take. But, you know, I think we as, as, an, as an operator, we pride ourselves that, that we always put ourselves in the ownership shoes. Uh, coming back down from, from Bill Heineke, our founder and chairman, you know, an entrepreneur at the heart. He has instilled that same spirit with us. And we always look at our hotels and, and our owners from an ownership perspective rather than an operator perspective. So we had some very hard talks with a lot of our owners that, you know, let's look at the EBITDA, let's look at the net profit and, and realize what makes sense. Does it make sense to operate in a disruptive time and, and cash is flooding out? Or do you then go into hibernating a property for an indefinite period of time? Again, not knowing what the future outlook may be. Um, and at the same time, risking losing a lot of team members and the whole ecosystem and the economy that dwells around the hotel, you know, be it the local farmers, be it the local industries, you know, everything are, are driven around this one hotel. So the moment you decide to hibernate, that decision is tough because you are affecting a whole economy around that hotel. So that was a tough decision to be taken. And now we're in the phase where we're looking at when is the right time to open? You know, we're going into these milestone phase. I think there's a lot of these, these ongoing variables that we're looking at every day and volatility is, is the name of the game and you have to be flexible. And I think we are constantly reviewing and going through and, and I'm proud to say during this very difficult time, I mean, because it's an industry hit, it's not a brand or a company hit, 
the unification has been tremendous. You know, I've, I've come together as an industry, as travel trade as a whole. We're not looking at competitors as competitors or us as different. We actually all become one unified basket of hoteliers and travel trade um, operators and, and working together hand in hand. And that has created a very different approach. Our team members have willingly taken cut paid leaves, furloughs, and all the measures that most are going through. But they've taken it on the notion that we want to safeguard the industry, not jobs. It goes down to a whole trade. You talk there about constantly reviewing, um, reviewing the, the situation and, and working together with, the, with your fellow hoteliers to, to, to see what's going on, to see what the news is. Has, has the messaging been, been clear from, from governments and from authorities on what you're allowed to do, what you're expected to do? Um, I think, you know, everybody is going through shockwaves throughout this journey, right? It is, you know, anyone who would say that I have a manual for this particular instance would, would probably not be telling the ultimate truth. And I think we all are experiencing these individual milestones and waves together. And I think that's where unification has been critical and sharing best practices across. I think for me, the most important uh, aspect, particularly looking at UAE, you know, we work very closely both with DCT and DTCM, and both authorities have been extremely communicative and they've worked hand in hand with us. And, you know, we have an ownership stake in Abu Dhabi with them. So we work very closely with them already in advance. And I think it's been a very important time to realize as an industry and as government bodies and hoteliers, that we're all in newfound territory. All of us are in this together. And the only way to come through this is to keep communication channels open across government bodies, across different brands, different companies, and across obviously the industry as a whole. And that's been probably the forte of the current time. Um, and in UAE, we've, we've, I'm confident managed it well, and we will continue doing so. Obviously, there are measures they have to take, which goes beyond what the travel trade would have liked, um, but their priority is obviously the health and safety and well-being of, of, of us as human beings. So I respect that tremendously and we've worked hand in hand with them across this whole journey. And I'm sure there's going to be a few more bumps down the road, but in the end, open communication is the key and, and, and remaining unanimous and, and unified. So I think that's, that's the, the positive side of it. And, um, looking forward, I think a lot of hoteliers that I've spoken to are looking to Q4 as a uh, as time when you know we're going to start getting back, we're going to start seeing some recovery, start seeing those occupancy numbers climb back up again. Um, what do you think, if any, uh, the long-term effects of, of this situation will be on the industry? You know, Q4 is the big discussion. A lot of people are saying between Q3 and Q4 is when you're going to see a slow comeback. Mm. I think that's where we, you know, have a major advantage, I believe, um, over a number of other operators potentially, especially on the Anantara brand. Anantara is synonymous for destination resorts, and we've always been the forefront of, of managing larger resorts and and and, and being um, staycation traveler. Uh, Focus. And I think that's going to be probably the first to recover in this wave is going to be the staycation travels, the short getaways and offering that opportunity of a safe haven getaway within across every country in the region um, that, that will cover. And I think that's going to be probably the first wave. And it's very interesting looking at um, uh, across our, our different properties, the private pool villas have become the new thing now. A lot of guests, you know, with the assurance, obviously, that, that we're giving them to stay with peace of mind. You know, they know that they will have their private space, they will have their private pool, they have a full contactless experience, they can stay within that vicinity and be fully assured while they're having a little getaway from home. So I think for us, we may see that coming back earlier than before. So we're looking at sort of a Q3 pickup uh, within the staycation getaways. So that's going to be an advantage for Anantara brand. I think Q4 will be a slow pickup for the city-based hotels. Um, I think the, the tough one is going to be more towards the mice and heavily corporate driven hotels. They're going to have probably a, a larger impact and, and I'm seeing sort of 2021 being more of a recovery year. Um, and you know, the big discussion is when will we hit 2019 numbers? I think that that may be a while out. I think the reality is taking it by step. You know, the first step is going to be staycation offerings. So our Anantara brand is going to go live across the region one by one over the coming months. 
and then slowly moving into the corporate based hotels towards Q4 and then later on in, in 2021 looking into banquets and mice and as social distancing is one of the areas that that's going to hopefully uh, dissolve so that's going to be uh, the future outlook. Um, looking to the future uh, in terms of pipeline uh, for, for minor, uh, has, has this current situation had an effect on, on your plans um, that were in place already? I mean, obviously, you know, it, it, it comes down to as well ownerships, liquidities, etc. It's very interesting. For this year, the openings that we had already in the pipeline are still on target um, with a few months delay. Um, but we're still on target to open two flagship Avani properties before end of this year, which is very exciting news for us. We're opening one um, actually just uh, before the entrance of the trunk of the palm, uh, which is the Avani Palm Views. And that's going to be a beautiful service department resident property. It's 527 bees, very, very large residential component. Um, and it's an interesting one. One of the reasons we're really going live with that one is, you know, during this period of COVID, our biggest demand hotels have been our service department business. You know, we, we operate, one of our arms is the Oaks Hotels and Resorts. So the Oaks model, uh, which is basically a service apartment component, and they've been doing tremendously well. I think the market volatility has created a lot of uncertainty for people. And people are more, you know, they've been much more receptive to moving into service apartments because it's no fuss, you know, there is no added value cost. They can move in, there is a flexibility of payment plans monthly. You know, they don't have all the additional costs. It's fixed, that's what I pay, and I don't have to worry about anything. So that has actually seen elevated demand for us. So we're doing tremendous well in the service apartment business. And that's why um, the Avani Palm View, uh, we're seeing opening hopefully by, by November this year. So that's going to be a positive one. And in Muscat, we have a stunning property as well, which is our new flagship Avani in the, in the heart of Muscat. It's going to be a mixed use of 160 rooms and 45 service apartments and a large ballroom component, which is probably going to be a phase two part now in the current situation. And so that's going to go live as well before end of this year uh, and on target at the moment, which is brilliant. And then we're launching our first NH collection brand in, in, uh, in the Middle East as well. Um, on the resort front, we have the Anantara Russell Kamer and we have the Anantara Plaza in Doha, which are both looking at Q3 next year and currently on target. But again, we're assessing and reviewing the pipeline. Um, I think the, the, the biggest excitement for me beyond that is the current situation and I would say the pause in the operation has given us an, an opportunity to look at some of the capital investments we have put on hold over a period of time in our existing results. And I think that was, you know, it's never the right time to shut down a property that's doing well. And that's always been the dilemma. You know, we have a beautiful Avani property in the Seychelles, in Barbaron and Seychelles, and that property has been historically running 90 plus percent occupancy. And we've been reviewing expansion and renovation plans for the longest period of time, but it's just never the right time. And COVID has sort of magnified that and said, wow, this is it. So we're going to now hopefully engage in, a, uh, in an extension plan there, adding a beautiful new 69 rooms and villas, etc. over this period. In Kasal Sara, which is our flagship uh, desert, probably in the Liwa Desert, we're just discussing with the owners and we're going to call it Kasa 2.0. And there's going to be a lot of expansions coming into Kasal Sara with new activities. So one part is obviously enhancement of exist existing facilities, but also adding a lot of new family activities and looking beyond COVID, again, with the wellness and holistic approach. We are a firm believer that that's going to be the new norm, that people are going to go moving in that direction. So there's going to be a lot of uh, offerings being added to Kasal Sara as well. And also another one that we're working on, we have a lot of exciting projects <laughs> at the moment, is in, the, in Jebel Akhtar, our mountain dessert. So, so in Jebel Akhtar, in Omar, you know, we have a beautiful Anantara property with the Diana Pier. So we're now um, changing the entire main pool. We're referring all of the pool villas, but we know that's going to be a major demand factor. And we're looking at adding new dining by design components as well. So private dining experiences off the pier of, of, the, of the resort. So there's a lot of projects in the pipeline and we're discussing across our, our ownership entities. to see obviously where cash flow and liquidity um, is available to maximize this opportunity so when we come back in post COVID, uh, we are revamped with new offerings and enhanced offerings. So that's going to be an exciting time for us. Well, that's great to hear so much positive news coming coming out of the group. And, and again, a great example 
of using a challenging time, using this downtime, using this hibernation of properties to, to come up with new ideas to, to invest uh, into the infrastructure. Um, and hopefully a lot of hoteliers take note as well. Um, <laughs> thank you very, very much for your time. Uh, and here, Govarg, it's always a pleasure to speak to you. My pleasure is mine, Claudio. Thanks a lot. Hope Thank you, you very soon. much. Thanks. Have a good Thank day. You. <laughs> Thank you. You too. <laughs>